So we're gonna look at some chemical principles now. Chemistry is the science that studies how molecules are formed and how they're going to interact with each other. And this is an important part of microbiology. But the quick question here is though, why do we study chemistry and microbiology? Well, these microorganisms that we're gonna discuss throughout the course, they rely on complex chemical reactions. These chemical reactions that take place in these microorganisms are called metabolism. Now the reason they do these chemical reactions is to maintain an internal balance that we call homeostasis. So some definitions we need to look at. We need to understand what an atom is. An atom is a small unit of an element, and these atoms are gonna be used to form molecules. Now, atoms are going to be composed of three subatomic particles. These particles include electrons, neutrons, and protons. Now, electrons, guys, are going to have a negative charge. Okay, so they're gonna have a negative charge. They have a mass of pretty much zero. They're very, very small, and so because of that, we're going to not even pay attention to how much mass they have. Their location is that they're located outside of the nucleus, which is the center part of the atom, and they are gonna be found orbiting around the nucleus. These are known as orbits or energy shells or levels. Neutrons, on the other hand, are gonna be found in the nucleus. Neutrons are neutral. They have no charge whatsoever. They're not positive, they're not negative, they are neutral. They are larger than electrons, so they are going to have a mass of one, and this is a mass of a one atomic mass units. Protons are also found in the nucleus. They are going to have a positive charge. They also have a mass of one atomic mass unit. When we're talking about atoms, atoms have equal number of positive and negative charges. They are considered neutral. This means they're gonna have the same number of protons and electrons, since those are the charged particles. So if an atom has five protons, which are positive, it also is going to have five electrons, which are negative, because five positives, five negatives cancel out to zero, which makes it neutral. We also need to look at a number of things that are related to an atom when they appear on the periodic table. Now I'm not gonna make you memorize the periodic table, but I do want you to be able to look at a box from the periodic table and see what information is present in it. So if you look at the box here in the corner, this is carbon, carbon is represented by a C, and you're gonna notice that there are two numbers. Okay, the top number we see here, which is the six, is the atomic number for carbon. The atomic number tells you the number of protons for that particular element. And this is what gives that element its uniqueness. When that number changes, the element changes. An atomic number of six, where it has six protons, to atomic number of seven, where it has seven protons, that's now no longer carbon, that's nitrogen. All right, and so this is gonna be unique to each atom or each element. We also see that in the box there's another number. This is called the atomic weight or the atomic mass. This is the number of protons plus neutrons. Now remember, we're not counting electrons here because electrons are so small. So this is gonna be the protons plus the neutrons. This gives us a number for the atomic mass. All we're doing is adding those two together. You'll notice in this case it is a decimal. This tells us that this is an average, meaning that some of these carbon atoms are going to end up having more neutrons than other carbon atoms. Others may have less neutrons, but the neutrons, guys, don't really matter in the sense of the charge. They just help with the weight. Okay, and so we can actually find out how many neutrons are present if we take the atomic weight minus the atomic number because we already know how many protons are there. So in this case, 12 minus six would say there's six, pretty much six neutrons in a carbon atom. When we're looking at the periodic table, we see that they are going to be, it is going to be composed of elements. All atoms of the same element have the same number of protons. Now they don't have to have the same number of electrons or neutrons, but they do have to have the same number of protons in order to be that particular element. We do see in the periodic table that 92 of these are naturally occurring elements. The others that are found on the chart are going to be man-made. 
Now with these elements, guys, they do have an electron configuration and these electron configurations are important because this tells you how they're going to interact and how they are gonna potentially form molecules through chemical reactions. We are gonna focus mostly on the electron configurations of some of the essential elements that most living things need. Okay, and these are what we call the chinops, which is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Now, when we're looking at electron configuration, they do have a first shell. This first shell or energy level is gonna be where two electrons can be found, if they have two. Okay, that's where they're gonna be found. That level is then full once there are two electrons. So the electrons, if they have more than two, are gonna then spill over into the next level. Levels two and three, those shells, are gonna hold up to eight va valence electrons. Those are going to have what we call the octet rule, and they are happy when they have the eight electrons. Okay, when they're full and happy, that's when that particular element is no longer going to react. Now, electrons do fill the inner shells first and then work their way out. We see that the first shell does contain two electrons and the second and third are gonna be full at eight. Now guys, this is very simplified. If you've taken a chemistry course, you know that this is more complex. Okay, when we're talking about electron configuration, that sort of thing. But we are looking at it at a more simplistic side of just how are these guys going to react if they need more electrons. If an atom is stable, meaning that its outer shell is full, either it has two in its first level or it has eight in that second or third, it's full, it's happy. These are not going to actually interact with anything. They're not going to be a participant in chemical reactions. So on the periodic table, these are known as the noble gases or the inert gases, and they're found at the very far side of the periodic table. Their shells are full, therefore they're happy, and they're very stable. So looking at electron configurations, we can actually see their the drawing of them, and we can also use the information with the atomic number and the atomic mass to determine those sub atomic particles, the protons, neutrons, and electrons. So let's look at hydrogen first over here in the gray. So hydrogen is represented by an H. It has an atomic number of one and an atomic mass of one. So what did we learn that the atomic number told us? Well, the atomic number tells us the number of protons. So the P here is gonna have one, there's one proton. Now remember, this is a hydrogen atom. When an atom, when we talk about an atom, an atom is neutral. When the atom is neutral, this means the number of positives have to equal the number of negatives. Well, the protons are the positive, the electrons are the negative. So since I have one proton, I will also have one electron in this case. The neutrons are determined by taking the atomic mass minus the atomic number. So in this case, the atomic mass is one, one minus one, which is the atomic number, is zero. This one has no neutrons present. All right, so now let's take a look at carbon. When we're looking at carbon, this is represented with a C. The atomic number is six and the atomic mass is 12. Since the atomic number is six, then this tells us we have six protons. Also, since there are six positives and this is a carbon atom, we are gonna have six electrons because that's the negative. And in order to find the neutrons, you're going to take the mass, which is 12, minus the atomic number, which is six. 12 minus six is six. All right, so this is how we are finding those particular subatomic particles for carbon. Moving on to nitrogen. Nitrogen has an atomic number of seven, so this tells us that that is going to have seven protons. Again, this is a nitrogen atom, so I have seven positives, therefore I need seven negatives. To find the neutrons, I take the atomic mass, which is 14, and I'm gonna subtract the atomic number, which is seven. So we see here that there are seven. Our last example we have here is oxygen. Oxygen is represented with the O. Its atomic number is eight, which tells us there are eight protons. In this example, since it is also an oxygen atom, we see I have eight positives, therefore we have eight negatives, eight electrons. To find those neutrons, I'm gonna take the atomic mass minus the atomic number, so 16 minus eight is eight. Now guys, you'll notice the majority of these have the same number all the way down. This is not always the case. It depends on the particular atom that you are viewing. Sometimes the same elements could have different numbers of neutrons. When they have different numbers of neutrons, those are known as isotopes. Isotopes are the same elements, but they have that different number of neutrons, which means they have a different atomic mass. 
Okay, so when we look at this example we had of oxygen up here, this was what we would consider an oxygen 16 because it had eight protons and eight neutrons for a total of 16. Down here I have an example where I have eight protons and nine neutrons. Well, eight plus nine is 17. So this particular oxygen isotope is heavier than the one that is in the example above. We also have another one that has eight protons, because remember, for it to be oxygen, it has to have the same number of protons. So eight protons, but now I have 10 neutrons. So this one's even heavier with an oxygen 18. So when we see that the atomic mass changes, that just is telling us the number of neutrons has changed. All right, so this brings us to what is a molecule versus what is a compound. Molecules are formed as a result of atoms chemically reacting together to fill their outer shell. So when we have a reaction that occurs and we see that they're trying to fill that outer shell, this is going to create molecules. On the other hand, we can also be more specific if we're talking about compounds. Compounds are when a molecule has at least two different types of atoms. So there has to be two different types of atoms in order for it to be called a compound. So I have an example here. We have, of course, an oxygen atom. This one is not bonding with anything yet, so we see it's an atom. In our next picture, though, I have two oxygen atoms bound together. They are sharing those electrons there, so they are reacting together. This is known as an oxygen molecule, an O2 molecule. Now, why could we not call it a compound? Well, we can't call it a compound because there's not two different types of atoms. There's just two oxygen. Oxygens are the same. Okay, so we cannot term it as a oxygen compound. It has to be an oxygen molecule. The next example is water. When we have oxygen bound to two different hydrogens, we see this is H2O. This is known as an H2O molecule, or it could be known as an H2O compound. This is because H2O, having the different types of atoms, allows us to also be able to call it a compound. So we can use it as a molecule or a compound here. So a quick concept that we're looking at is that compounds can be referred to as molecules, but not all molecules can be called compounds, all right? So these, when we're talking about a compound, it's more specific. It's kind of like when you look at the whole idea of a rectangle versus a square. A rectangle is a shape that has four sides. Well, a square has four sides, but a square is going to have four equal sides sides. It's more specific. The same thing here. A compound is more specific versus a molecule. All right, so now since we've talked a little bit about the electron configurations, we talked a little bit about molecules and compounds, let's talk about the bonds that they can form. What can these particular atoms form bond-wise in order to create these molecules or compounds? So chemical bonds are formed between atoms when they chemically react to complete that outer shell, to become happy with their outer shell. There's two main types of bonds we're going to talk about, ionic bonds and covalent bonds that happen between atoms. The last bond we're going to talk about are called hydrogen bonds, and these are bonds between molecules. So there is a difference here. All right, so ionic and covalent bonds happen between atoms, and hydrogen bonds happen between molecules. So let's look at ionic bonds first. An ionic bond forms between atoms when they donate or accept electrons. Now remember, electrons have a negative charge. So if an atom is gonna donate an electron, meaning it's gonna give it away, it's gonna give away one of its negatives, so it becomes what we call positive. This is known as a positive ion or a cat ion. It now has a positive charge because it has more protons than it has electrons. On the other hand, if that particular atom is going to accept an electron, it's going to take the negative. This means it's going to have more negatives than positives, so it's going to have a negative charge. This is a neg negative ion called an anion. Now, when one donates and the other accepts, we see that we have a positive ion and a negative ion, and in this case, opposites are going to attract. They're going to attract to each other and they're going to bond together. One of the best examples of this is table salt, NaCl. Sodium has one electron in its outer shell. In order for it to be happy, it needs eight total. This means it has to get seven more. How's it going to get seven electrons? That would be very difficult. So because of that, instead, it's going to give away the one that's in the outer shell. 
Now that it gave it away, it has eight in the next shell and it's happy, but it has a positive charge. So this is known then as a sodium ion. Chlorine, on the other hand, has seven in its outer shell, so it only needs one to be happy. Well, it's like, yeah, sodium, if you're gonna give away that electron, I will totally take it. It accepts it, which means then it has a negative charge, and we call this a chloride ion. Again then, sodium and chlorine are gonna have opposite charges, so they are going to attract, and this is known as sodium chloride or table salt. Okay, so these are ionic bonds. Covalent bonds are different. Covalent bonds are gonna happen when atoms are gonna share electrons. They are not gonna give up their electrons completely like sodium did, and one's not gonna receive them completely like chlorine did. These guys are gonna share. They're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna keep the electrons for part of the time, and you're gonna keep them for the rest of the time. All right, it's kinda of like shared custody in a sense. And these are gonna happen again between these atoms to where their outer shell is full at least part of the time. So example here, we have these two hydrogen ions. Remember the first energy level or shell needs two to be happy, so they each have one. So the two hydrogens get together and say, hey, those two electrons will stay with you part of the time and then they'll stay with me part of the time. When we see covalent bonds, we see that we represent them with a straight line in between. So when H bonds to another H with a straight line, that is showing you a covalent bond. Another example is down here with carbon. Carbon has four in its outer shell and it needs eight to be happy. So it needs four more. In this case, it's coming in contact with four separate hydrogens. Each of these hydrogens has one electron. And so carbon says, hey, I'll share with you one of my electrons if you share your electron with me. So carbon is gonna bond with all four of these. So carbon here is in the middle with a line to each of the hydrogens, and again, those are showing you how they are sharing the electrons. In this case, this creates methane, a methane molecule. Sharing is hard. We see this in real life. People don't like to share. And even when we do share, sometimes we don't share evenly. You've ever done that thing where it's like one for you, two for me, one for you, two for me type of thing. Atoms do this too sometimes, especially if the atoms are different sizes. Sometimes the bigger atom may actually hold on to the electrons more often. This is still a covalent bond because they're sharing, but they're not sharing equally. When they don't share equally, it creates a different type of covalent bond, which is called a polar bond. This is really important when we look at water, which we'll see in just a second. So here is a water molecule. A water molecule is an oxygen, and oxygen has six in its outer shell. It needs two more to be happy. So oxygen's gonna bond with two hydrogens. When it bonds with these two hydrogens, though, oxygen doesn't play fair. Oxygen keeps the electrons more often, so instead of like a 50-50 sharing, it might be more like a 60-40 or even like a 70-25 or 75-25. They're not sharing equally. And so because of this, we see that the oxygen starts to have a slight negative charge. And since it has a slight negative charge, the hydrogens are gonna have a slight positive charge. This is why we call it a polar covalent bond because it creates a pole. It creates a positive pole and it creates a negative pole, kind of like how we have the north and south pole. They're opposites. Okay, so it creates these poles. When these poles are created in molecules like this that do not share equally and they're called polar covalent bonds, this allows this bond between molecules to form that we call hydrogen bonds. In this case, you can see there's a water molecule sitting here in the middle, and one of its hydrogens is attracted to an oxygen on another water molecule. Its other hydrogen is attracted to a different oxygen on a different water molecule, and this creates these hydrogen bonds. Now, hydrogen bonds are relatively weak bonds, but we do see that when there's a lot of them together, they can actually be pretty strong. This, when we look at water underneath a microscope, makes water look kind of like a chain link fence because it's all connected with these hydrogen type bonds. And this structure of these polar covalent bonds and these hydrogen bonds help give water some unique characteristics. And those characteristics are very important for life. So concept here, water has polar covalent bonds between hydrogen and oxygen, but hydrogen bonds are gonna form between water molecules. Okay, so there's that difference. We see that the covalent bond is between the actual atoms, hydrogen and oxygen, but the hydrogen bonds are between the water molecules, okay, the whole molecule.
So let's talk about these chemical reactions. Chemical reactions are involved in making and breaking these chemical bonds that we've talked about. So either making covalent bonds, making ionic bonds, or breaking them. Now, reactants are always what goes into the chemical reaction and products are always what comes out of the chemical reaction. There are two kind of main types of chemical reactions that we're gonna discuss here. One is synthesis and the other is decomposition. In synthesis reactions, we are gonna build things. So we're gonna take A and B and we're gonna build them into AB, okay? So this is a synthesis, it's a building process. On the other hand, we see in a decomposition reaction, we're starting with AB and we're gonna break it apart into A plus B. This is decomposition. We also see in a synthesis reaction, this is known as an anabolic reaction, which means it's building up things. Decomposition is a catabolic reaction where it's breaking things down. Now, in order to build molecules, we have to use more energy. We've got to put more energy into it, and so these are called endergonic reactions. So when we're gonna build something, we have to put more energy into it, and so these are known as endergonic reactions. On the other hand, decomposition are going to break the bonds, and when they break the bonds, energy is released. So these are exergonic reactions. So more energy is released or let out of that reaction. So the concept here is that metabolism is the sum of all your chemical reactions. It's all the chemical reactions that an organism undergoes. So it's the building up and it's the breaking down that takes place. So this is constantly going to be where it stores energy in an endergonic and releases energy in an exergonic. It's a constant back and forth within the organism. So let's take a little closer look at the synthesis reactions. Synthesis reactions do build up new molecules. They are anabolic reactions. And we also see that they are sometimes called dehydration reactions. The reason they are known as dehydration reactions is that this is because water gets removed in order to build the bond. So if you look in the picture here, you can see that an H from one of the monomers, which means one part, is gonna combine with an OH from another monomer. That OH from the other monomer with that H from the first is going to cause water to form and it's gonna be removed. Once we remove the water, those two molecules now are holding hands. They're bonded together, okay? So since they're bonded together, water was removed. It's called a dehydration reaction. Now, monomers are the building blocks of bigger molecules called polymers. So an example of this is we would use simple sugars to create complex sugars, or amino acids, which are the building blocks for proteins, to make proteins, or nucleotides to make nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. But we are building things up, and water is being removed. A wa water is a product of these types of reactions. On the other hand, decomposition rea reactions are the opposite. They're breaking down the molecules. Remember, these are catabolic, and they also are known sometimes as hydrolysis reactions. Hydrolysis means that we are going to use water to break the bond. Hydro means water, lysis means to break. So we're gonna use water to break these bonds. So you're gonna add water in, and when water comes in, it breaks the bond, kind of like when you play Red Rover and you're holding hands and somebody breaks through. The water is gonna break through and it's gonna take the big molecule and break it into two. This takes complex carbohydrates and breaks them down into the simple sugars. We then see we can break proteins down into their amino acids and nucleic acids get broken down into the building block called the nucleotide. In this case, since water goes in, it's a reactant to this reaction. Now there's two other types of reactions that we do see taking place. One is called exchange reactions, and this is where synthesis and decomposition are actually happening at the same time. We're gonna break the bonds in order to form new bonds. It's kinda like changing dance partners. A and B were dancing together first over here and C and D, and then they decided to switch partners. A now wants to dance with D, and C wants to dance with B. They've exchanged their partners. We also see there are what we call reversible reactions. Reversible reactions are gonna have arrows going both ways, and this tells you that the reaction can move back and forth. We can build things, we can tear them apart. We can build it, we can tear it apart, and it's a constant back and forth when there's a reversible reaction. So now we're gonna talk about inorganic versus organic molecules, and we're gonna focus mostly here on inorganic right now. 
So inorganic molecules lack carbon bonded to hydrogen. So you're not going to see C and H together here. Okay, C and H together are going to be seen in organic molecules, but here we don't have that. Usually these are small molecules and they actually have ionic bonding as their main bond type. There is an exception though. Um, there are exceptions though and water is one of them. Water is a big exception to this. It is an inorganic molecule but it uses covalent bonds. Now, because of water's physical and chemical properties, it actually is what allows life to be sustained. Now, polar covalent bonds, the whole idea of creating the poles or polarity, and hydrogen bonds are going to also help water be successful in a number of ways. One, it makes it where water is a really good solvent. Solvent means that it's going to be able to dissolve things like salt or other different compounds or chemicals. We also see that water is going to be able to participate in many of the chemical reactions. We're either taking water out or we're adding it. We saw that on those previous slides. We also see that water has a low density as a solid. When water freezes and turns to ice, it actually is gonna have a lower density and this is why ice floats. Another thing that's really important with water is that water has a high boiling point and it resists changes in state. Okay, it takes a lot of energy to get water to boil and for it to change from a liquid to a gas or to change from a liquid to a solid. Now this is important because it being able to maintain temperatures and not change too much is good for us because majority of our body is made of water. And if water changed temperatures quickly on really cold days in the winter, if you went outside, your water would freeze inside of you. On the other hand, where I live, where it's hot a lot, we go in outside, it would cause our water to boil inside of us. Not good either. All right, so this whole idea of making sure where water doesn't change temperatures too greatly is a big deal. And guys, we see this. When you go in the summer and you first fill up a swimming pool, it's very cold at first. And then the sun is gonna help heat it up, but it takes a long time to heat that pool up. Okay, especially if it's a large pool with a lot of cold water to start with. Okay, and so that it's gonna resist that change of temperature unless you do something to speed it up. Kind of like the same thing when you wanna make mac and cheese. Getting that water to boil, it's gonna take a while to do that. Or the opposite, when you wanna make ice, you don't fill up the ice tray and stick it in there and an hour later you have ice. It takes a long time for those changes to take place. But this is a key thing characteristic for water and again it helps us to be able to sustain life. Another thing with organic molecules is they can be classified as one of three things. They're either acids, bases, or salts and this depends on how they dissociate or break apart in water. What kind of ions do they create? And remember ions are a charged atom. Okay, If they create positive hydrogen ions they are considered an acid. Right? If they create negative hydroxide ions, they are considered a base. So you can see those in the first two pictures. The first one, hydrogens are being made, so it is an acid. The second, OH is given off, so it's a base. If they don't give off either of those, they just give off something else, that's when they're considered a salt. Now, this whole idea of acids and bases are important because this is what leads us to our pH scale. The pH scale is gonna measure the power of the hydrogens, how many hydrogens are present. Now, when we talk about the power, this means it's an exponential thing. And so when we go from one level to the next, it's gonna be a little more complicated than just going from one to two, which we'll talk about in a second. If a solution has a pH below seven, this means it has more hydrogens and less OH hydroxides. It's known as being acidic. If the pH is above seven, it has lower hydrogens and more OHs, so it is considered basic. If it's right at seven, it's neutral. Okay, so below seven acid, above seven base, right at seven, it's a neutral. Now guys, as the pH goes down, it gets closer to zero, the concentration of hydrogen ions goes up, the more acidic it becomes. Now, a change in one pH unit represents a tenfold change. It's not just going from one to two, it's a tenfold change. So if you're going from a pH of one to a pH of two, it's 10 times the difference. If you're going from a pH of one and you're gonna compare it to a pH of three, it's 100 times different. 
Okay, it's tenfold, which means every step you take, you're gonna add a zero. Okay, so if you go from one to four, that's gonna be a thousand. If you go from one to five, that's 10,000. It's a big change that's happening in each step. Buffers are going to be things or chemicals that help resist a change in pH. This is gonna help maintain homeostasis. Remember, we want a constant internal and even microbes want this. Now, pH does fluctuate as a result of our metabolisms. When cells undergo metabolism, chemical reactions, the pH is gonna change. It might become more acidic or more basic. So a buffer needs to be put in there to help with this. And one important way is in microbiology, this is why inside those plates where we grow bacteria, the media that's in there is gonna contain buffers. This allows us to successfully be able to grow that bacteria and grow it pretty quickly. Different organisms, though, are gonna flourish at different pHs. Some microorganisms are gonna like acidic pHs. Others are gonna like basic. But majority of them, guys, they like right in the middle. They like anywhere between 6.5 and 8.5 in the pH, with seven smack dab in the middle. Okay, and so majority of them are gonna be very mild in their pHs, but some like the extreme acid, some like the extreme base. Mm -hmm.